Hello. So um, visibility in action is back. Um, now, those of you that may have listened to or watched previous episodes know this all started really as a way to amplify LGBTQ plus voices in STEM. Um, back in 2020, you know, when you know diversity and inclusion was was really at the fore uh, of conversations across lots of businesses and and you know outside businesses as well. Um, really felt like it was time to yeah start amplifying these voices get get ourselves heard really and since then um it was really noticeable to me in all of those conversations just how intersectional they were becoming so yes we were talking about issues affecting lgbtq people but actually everything from neurodiversity to uh, disability um you know religious background languages that you might speak or not speak you know all aspects of diversity really I, I can't list all of them came up in those conversations um and it really led me to think okay let's broaden the horizons a little bit and start talking about um visibility and diversity in stem more broadly so the next series of conversations will do just that um and the first one um begins uh, by looking at the experiences of a latino woman in canada um and uh, well i will let her introduce herself now okay so um thank you adriana for joining me today uh we will start with the obligatory who are you um <laughs> that everyone finds a little bit cringy to do but we've all done it enough by now to uh to kind of just just go for it so yeah why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself before we get about to me. Our topics for the day <clears throat> i love it dave thank you first of all thank you so much for having me here i think we're both very passionate about the both topics that we're going to talk uh in in your podcast today and i'm very excited to be you know part of this so i'm adriana romero i'm reporting from toronto canada as you can see in my background no it is not spring right now it is winter but you know i i consider the city as beautiful in all seasons <laughs> it is very, very white and icy in Scotland right now as well. So I'm, yes. I'm sure it looks similar. <laughs> it kind of looks, yeah, it's it's like, it looks like sprinkled because we had some snow on Sunday, but we uh, are expecting a snowstorm tomorrow. Oh, we just had the nice, no, no snow. The rest of the, the rest of Scotland's been hit by snow, <laughs> but none for me, it's just been minus seven, um, which is Ooh. fun. We are, we are the same. We are exactly <laughs> in the same temperature. Anyway, so I am a um, immigrant from Venezuela and I came to Canada in 2006. It sounds a long time ago, right? And some days it sounds like I'm just recently landed. I am also a systems engineer who was, uh, went into sales and then went into sales enablement. And Dave and I know each other uh, in the sales enablement world. Currently, I work for Salesforce and I have worked for several companies and startups, mainly in the technology uh, industry. Uh, when I was in sales, I sold a little bit of everything. I went to the beer industry. I went into retail. So I've done, you know, for an engineer, I've done a little bit of a, of a, you know, rounded career, <laughs> but that brings me to today. And yeah. yeah, super, super happy to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for, for coming on. Um, so you are a little bit of a guinea pig, Adriana, today. And as we've spoken about before, um, you know, anyone who's watched an episode of Visibility in Action before knows it started as very much um, a sort of platform to amplify LGBTQ voices in STEM. And those conversations, you know, got me um, talking to lots and lots of people from lots of different, you know, countries, lots of different walks of life, uh, or walks of life, I should say. Um, and it really brought forward the sort of intersectionality of what we call diversity. Yeah. You know, so we were talking about LGBTQ plus issues, but it got us into things about um, culture, about race and ethnicity, about disability, about um, neurodiversity, and, and you know all of the different elements of, of diversity and inclusion that are out there. And it struck me after a little while that it seemed very restrictive to only be talking about our experiences as queer people as opposed to as people who, you know, I hate to use the phrase tick box, but tick several of the T and I boxes. Exactly. Um, and, you know, it, this this whole series started as a route for me to, to learn and to share some of those stories, because I only know my own story. Um, you know, I can talk as a queer person in, in STEM, but everyone's different. Um, but I am, you know, not an expert in the experiences of, um, you know, people from 
you know, other cultures, other countries, people who have, um, you know, moved thousands of miles as you did. And I think it's a really good opportunity to, to kind of share some of those stories as well. And, and actually things that people might not think about as much, those, those kind of more invisible conversations um, and topics that I think are just as important to, to talk about. So um, the thing we talked about first, you know, was the idea of, of gender and culture and how that's impacted your career, but also the careers of other Latino women that you've spoken to over your your kind of your life so far. We talked about mentorship, we talked about its importance, but why don't we start by, I suppose, just diving into some of those aspects of gender and culture and how you feel that's both affected your career path um, as a benefit, as a hindrance, you know, and, and how it's maybe seen today compared to when you first moved to, to Canada all those years ago. A hundred percent. I would also say, you know, when I go back, this started even before I moved. Right. I think there's there's a portion of all this before I became an immigrant and mm. then after I became an immigrant, because to your point, the boxes that you tick, <laughs> right, what are the things that you because you can uncover that you have a certain type of neurodiversity later mm. in life, you can uncover or you can have a different ability later in life. Um, it, it, it's something that is changing. This is not static. You True. can uncover, there's so many things, your sexual orientation can change in life. And I think that's something that it could be depending on your environment or the things that you discover about yourself or, you know, <clears throat> there's so many things that influence that your point about ticking the boxes. I think that that's not a static situation. Mm -hmm. It's something that's continuously evolving. So if I go back to when I was in my home country, let's start with the fact that going into a university in 1991, when many, many, may, many, maybe of our listeners have not, you know, were being born. <laughs> uh, it was not common to see women in an engineering career. It was very few of us. I did systems engineering. And I think I remember my first class, it was 60 people and maybe it was 10 women. And I think that because my engineering had a little bit more, let's say, open, I don't know how to say opening, but it was like a little bit more attractive to women. But if I remember going and seeing the classes of mechanical engineering and chemical engineering, they had three women, one woman mm -hmm. sometimes, right? And it was even more difficult to see a professor that was, you know, visibly a woman at that point in time. So you're already running against a lot of things that are, you feel that are going to be against you. It's people telling you, maybe you're not cut up to be an engineer. People telling you this is tough. And that starts to put all these, you know, barriers in your mind that maybe you go ahead and you do it and you graduate, but it creates, it creates this barrier of, am I good enough? Am I going to be able to do this? And then, you know, you go to the workforce and going back and, and getting a job back in my home country, culture in Latin America, as, as many people might, might know, women are not as respected where females are not as respected. It is, you know, the whole culture of you have to look a certain way, you have to dress a certain way. Um, there's this whole culture about body image that is very toxic and it is very, uh, it's intimidating. Like it, 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 it sometimes in the morning when you were going to get dressed up, like, how should I look? Like, how, how should I not send the wrong message? Because there was always a wrong message. Like I'm, I'm coming from a culture where I, before I came, I remember going like being in companies where resumes came with a picture and people would actually categorize, um, you know, people that were, that were applying for the job based on the picture, which is the thing that we do not do. So it, it, it was a very, very um, maybe toxic environment to be in. So then I move and I come to Canada where there's, a very big opportunity to be who you are. Because one thing about Canadian culture is that you can embrace Canadian culture, but you ha don't have to lose who you are. And that means who you are from your culture perspective. There's many things from my culture that I love and I, and I miss and I bring, but you also, you know, you embrace other cultures, you learn about other cultures and you're here. So it was different challenges. It was the challenge of how do I prove myself in this new environment that I don't know anybody, that I don't have a network? How do I tell them that, yes, I have 
you know, by the point I moved in into Canada, I think I had like 10 years of experience in my career, maybe eight to 10. Like, how do I tell them that this is all true? Like, I don't have anybody here to vouch for me. And then it's also the challenge of, you know, the, the females in STEM. And, and when I say female, it's the visibly, you know, a female person who, because of the way they look, some people don't believe they belong in a certain field. And mm -hmm. I think that has improved from when I studied, like, especially when you see a lot of people that are, you know, you see the images, I see the images of Latinas in NASA. And I'm like, yes, this is the role model I need for my daughter. Now that I want her to be in NASA, but I want her to know that everything mm -hmm. is possible. So you, you come with that challenge of you're the newcomer. You are the person who needs to prove it. And as a, and as a female, you need to prove it like more, like there's a double, there's a thing that you have to prove it a little bit more because of, the, of what everybody knows of the workplace and, you know, how the comparison and especially in technology companies, let's face it. Mm -hmm. yep. I am very lucky to be in a place that was a pioneer on level setting the, the field between pay of women and men, but out there in the, in the outside in the industry, there's still discrepancies. And there are studies about how Latina women are even paid less than a white woman or mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there was a lot of disadvantages that I came in here with. And you had to start kind of like making yourself, you know, get into it. But then the other issue that many people don't talk about as much is you are in childbearing years. And that also sets up an alarm for companies that are hiring you, people that are working with you, because what's going to happen when she, if she wants to become pregnant, right? What happens if she decides to have a kid? especially nowadays that people are having kids a little bit later in life. You know, they're waiting till their late thirties. I waited till my late thirties, but there's always that kind of big question mark on top of you of, Oh, this one will become pregnant. And I remember having that feeling of being asked those questions in interviews. Like, are you thinking about planning a family? And I'm like, I don't know what to answer. <laughs> yeah. Because if I say yes, which was what I wanted to do, will that hinder my opportunity here? Mm -hmm. Which it's not fair. <laughs> completely. And that's a really interesting topic to raise because honestly, it's something I know so little about, you know, it's one of those questions that you fear is maybe skirted around, you know, yes. in the past, like you say, you, you were up front asked the question, which as wrong as that is, at least it was transparent where now I do worry sometimes if, I, if I'm, you know, speaking to hiring managers, we're looking at hiring processes those questions are in their head yes and you as a, a woman being interviewed might be able to read that behind the you know between the lines yes. but no one's actually outright having that conversation probably because it's not relevant to a job interview but at the same time those thoughts are still in people's minds yes. you know if you're interviewing a woman of a certain age pe people do still think like that whereas if I were to go and interview, for you, <clears throat> no one would ask me that question. And, and you know, and you know what? Explicitly or otherwise. Exactly, Dave. But also, let's think about it the other way. Why can't people think if you want to plan a family? Mm -hmm. Right? It, I mean, you're not going to be the, 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 the individual getting pregnant, but what about if you want to adopt? How about if yeah. you have a plans of with your partner getting a surrogate? Like, that is being, I mean, I think that becoming a family means different things to different people. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, in, in the world that, that we are today, and it has to be respected because I think that this is why companies come with plans of paternity leave mm -hmm. and maternity leave and all these leaves yeah. to ensure that people have times with their families. But then there's that double standard when you're being interviewed of, if I say I'm planning this, wow, maybe this is not going to be so good and they're not going to hire me. And they're going to come with an excuse of the other candidate had more experience than you that we mm -hmm. all know. You know, yes. that is an excuse. So I don't know what the solution is for this. If we should all be like very real and say, look, I'm just asking you so we can plan. So if you're planning and, you know, adopting a kid, having a family, whatever, <clears throat> we can plan resources, you know, as this project mm -hmm. goes. And we know I would like to have that upfront conversation. Like if I go back 10 years or 15 years and I'm being interviewed and somebody says, we're just planning because we're a team. So we know that when you're out, we yeah. got you covered. 
I want that frank conversation because that doesn't make think... me feel feared. <clears throat> yeah, I, I can I can see why that that would make such a difference. I mean, do you think that may almost naturally change as hopefully we get to a point of more gender equity at leadership level? I hope so. You know, is is that the natural progression? You know, you don't necessarily have to kind of force changes like that through because they are a byproduct of making leadership more equal to begin with a hundred percent and also making leadership having these upfront conversations even with candidates or with people mm -hmm. you know i remember one of the of the companies that i interviewed for once it was a very young company people were not thinking about families they were thinking about making money and partying and i remember being at that stage of my life but i remember my hiring manager was a father and he was very upfront and he said, I am a father and my family comes first. And I was like, this is refreshing. Thank you. You know, thank you. Because it means that when I put my family first, I'm not going to feel guilty when I yeah. take this job. And that made that relationship from the get go, very transparent and very easy. So I think it's also a matter of the diversity on the, on the leadership. You know, let's have more people that are from what we said at the beginning, different realms and mixes, right? Of life, mm -hmm. of, of wants, of abilities. So they can be more empathetic to what the person that they're working with are. And also let's, let's make it easy also for, you know, and I'm, I, I'm going to say, I, I sometimes see the struggle in, in men when they're like, no, I can't say anything about my family or that's mm -hmm. not proper. Like, let's make it easy. You guys are fathers. Mm -hmm. You're also taking care. And you know, I know there's a lot of more burden on the mothers and, and we can have, you know, we can go down that rabbit hole, but let's also make it fair for the fathers. I know a lot of single fathers that are out there trying mm -hmm. to make ends meet working. So I think it's, it's that kind of conversation, yeah. but. But there's a policy thing there as well, isn't there? There's, yeah. you know, having, you know, shared parental leave policies and things like that, which, um, you know, I don't know a huge amount about how that works in Canada, but if you go south of the border in the US, for example, paternity leave is oh, yeah. shockingly it's, short. It's, and even in bad. Europe, it varies a lot, but you look at, you know, Scandinavian countries in particular are, you know, doing amazing things there. And I think there are other companies even here in, in the UK that are starting to push towards that shared leave, which again, 100%. naturally makes those conversations more transparent. Um, this is a thought off the top of my head. I do wonder if lockdowns, the pandemic, have relaxed some of those conversations. I've certainly noticed since this all started back in, in March 2020, you know, it all started with everyone still going into the meeting, you know, clearly suited, at least yes. in the top half, um, having these very formal conversations. But gradually over time, and particularly now, everyone is more relaxed. You see people's kids in the background where you're having a business conversation with them, not just with other people from your company, but from people you're, you're talking to, that you're selling to, that are selling to you, you know. Has that relaxed those conversations? Oh, or yes. People interviewing at those stages now are more used to family and work blending and, you know, being less separate. I think as a mother, if I would have to go into like an interview nowadays, I would be more relaxed to be very upfront of this is the time. This is when I pick up my kid. You know, this is what I do. And when, if my kid is home and I'm working from home, she might make an appearance in a meeting like that's, mm -hmm. and I have no shame. My daughter has made appearances. My dog has made appearances and I really don't care. And I tell people, look, I need to move because my husband is in a call and I need to move because, you know, we, we yeah. share an office. So that's why I use background. So you don't see me moving. <laughs> it will make you dizzy, <laughs> but I tell people. How many times I'm, I've never had a meeting in my jammies because I am that type of person that I wake up and I change because I have to get a kid to the bus stop for her school bus. <laughs> so I can't be in my jammies, but I will be in that kind of like, you know, relaxed mommy clothes and the mommy bun. Come on, let's talk about the mommy bun. Mommy bun is like a stable and working from home, you know? And I think it's, it has relaxed us to make us see like there's a reality. Like we're busy, our kids get sick. Uh, we have mm -hmm. families, we might have uh, people we're caring for and as our family yeah. members that are not your kids, it might be your aunt, your uncle, your parents, you might have um, a family member with an ability, uh, you know, different ability that you need to take care of, you might have a neurodiverse kid that you need to take care of, I think that all this with the pandemic really helped, making us understand what matters the most, yes. and I think that's the most important thing is that we all said, 
I am not going to go to a place that doesn't respect my time with my family or my time with my partner or my, t- or my time. Like, I think it's also a fact of let's, let's step back and say, there's so many different ways of an individual in their life. We have to respect the people who are single too, just because you are, you don't have a family. doesn't mean, no, we're going to work you out until eight o'clock at night. No, you have hobbies, <laughs> yeah. you know, you have friends, you have things to do that is not only work. And I think that it's not only the system is that also us as individuals, we have become much more respectful of what it means because we were in a pandemic where we saw we could lose a lot. We could lose families, yes. we could lose friends. And we saw, wow, I was missing out on this. I remember thinking that oh, I was completely. missing out on picking up my daughter from school or bringing her to school or walking to the bus. I was missing that day. And for yeah. what? So, I mean, to somewhat realize and back to the, the original topic, um, because we could go on, I think, and talk. Oh yeah, about we that. need to, like, you know, that's, it's like that's a, that's a whole other thing. But it's fascinating to talk about because things are so different, you know. To yeah. I, I started recording visibility in action in March 2020, so this was all, you know, just starting to happen, and we hadn't really understood how the DE and I conversation was going to change over that time, and it's, it's become more prominent, which I think was going yes. to happen anyway, um, because there were other events going on that kind of kicked that off, but it's. It's brought it to the fore more and you know we're recording this at the very end of 2022 this episode should go live beginning of 2023 who knows when it is when you are watching this um but we're at a point where unfortunately particularly in tech not necessarily in the engineering and manufacturing parts of stem that you know i am also active in in my role um but in tech there has been huge amounts of layoffs but what yes. certainly i haven't seen working for a recruitment company is the conversation about candidates expectations and behavior shifting all that much from what it was 12 months ago there is still luckily a lot of open jobs out there there's this weird kind of split in the market between layoffs versus still hiring very very quickly and it's really difficult to kind of pin down from one company to the next but what it does mean is the people that are being laid off are still able to be in control to a large degree of the decision of where they go next. I'm not gonna say that applies to everybody. Some people really desperately need a job. Uh, You know, they've got families to look after. They they can't necessarily be that picky, but there are going to be people, perhaps people earlier in their career who are, you know, single, don't have those responsibilities yet, who still are very much in control of the decisions they take about where they go next. And what you're saying about, you know, leadership culture and that level of transparency I think there may be companies who wanted to switch back to the way things were in 2019. Mm. And I wonder if it's candidate behavior as they try to hire that's more than anything else telling them they can't. It could how, be. It's... How does that affect the, the conversation you might have as, you know, a migrant woman in tech? Exactly. Woman in tech. But what does that decision making for someone for, for you 20 years ago, let's say implant you 20 years ago into 2022, what, what would that look like for you as you were searching for a new role? You know, would the power dynamic be different, do you think? It's very interesting because I think I would not go back to having a process like, as you said, like in 2019, even, mm-hmm. you know, 2002 and 2000, I, I would not go back to that. I have different priorities that I will not try to push back because I want the job. Also, another thing, I'm going to tell you a story about how, you know, character, you know, the, the character and, the, and, and the, the candidate and how we decide what is important for us will make the career that you want. When I was new to Canada, it was like maybe 2000, late 2000, no, 2007, 2007, 2008. Um, I was, you know, my company had, we were in financial crisis. You know, companies were laying off exactly same story a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And I was looking for a job. And I said, when I was new to Canada, I had to look for what was considered kind of like survival job as we immigrants talk about it. It was a little bit higher than a survivor job, but it still was not my ideal. So mm-hmm. I decided at this point, I'm like, okay, now that I was laid off of this survival job, I want to look for my career. And I decided to look for some professional coaching. And I found this firm who promised me, you know, all the, all the things I collected the amount of money that they were asking me for from, I don't know where underneath rocks. I don't know how I 
pressed things to kind of make that money. I was, I had no job. I was recently divorced and I needed to pay a mortgage. So you can imagine the mm -hmm. financial constraints of all that. So I decided to pay it. And I started this process by like the third meeting, I go into a coaching session and I'm going to put it in, in marks because that's not a coaching session. And the gentleman who was coaching me, you know, who you can see was very, um, I would say constrained by his way in the mind of how a candidate should look like. Right. And this is a, and this was the first time I confronted a whole, these, you know, somebody is asking me to hide my way of being Latina. He said that I had too much presence and I was a little bit too loud and I should like tone it down. And I was like, excuse me. He's like, yeah, I, you know, people might feel intimidated by that. And I remember thinking at that moment, if people do not like me as I come, like as I am when I walk into the door, then why should I work there? Like if they do cannot accept me, like talk about this, like I don't, it's like, this is who I am. How am I going to work there? And why do I have to hide things about me to work in a company? Needless to say, I stopped that coaching. I even fought for my money back. So let's talk about, that's another topic. <laughs> and another moment was I was in another company and this, this, uh, this manager that I had said that I should not have phone calls in Spanish in the office wow. because he knew that if I was having a phone conversation in Spanish, I was not working because that was a personal thing. And I was like, how are you going to tell me not to talk with somebody like from my family or something? Because you, you do not want to hear me speaking in Spanish. That is the way I speak with people. Needless to say, I look for another job. Yeah. But those, those are the type of, of things that I would not, like, I didn't accept them back then. I think I kind of conformed to some of the norms to sometimes mm -hmm. fit into a certain mold because maybe, you know, you need a job or whatever. But today I would not even like, I would like buy, like, thank you. Goodbye. And I would like, you know, walk away or close the meeting because we cannot go back to how things were. People have to respect how people are. People have to make accommodations in their companies for different types of abilities. And it's interesting, Dave, because as we were talking about this, I've been working a lot into going deeper into how to make training more, more, you know, let's call it with a fan of, of opportunities for people with different abilities and different walks mm -hmm. of life, right? Because, you know, it's not only about the abilities that everybody kind of like knows, like maybe if you have an ability of listening or of reading, but mm -hmm. also how do you identify with the content and the images and all those things? Like, let's, let's, let's think about this. There's a reason why kids' movies have now started to show more di diverse characters than they did when yes. I was a kid. There's a reason why Barbie has more diverse dolls than when I was a kid. Because if your child cannot see themselves in the character, they're not going to, you know, to go after it because they're not going to believe in it. Same okay. happens to our inner child, right? So that is very important also to address. Not only is getting the person through the door and doing all the things is, what are you doing internally to make sure that that person feels like they belong there? Yes, you know, it's, it, it's that thing about D and I are almost the wrong way around. The, the inclusivity has to come first. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if your mm -hmm. team is as full of, you know, 30 something white middle class men <laughs> as, as it possibly could be. If there isn't an element of education and inclusivity for when that's not the case, anyone like you say who comes in is going to immediately feel alienated. And it's education is a huge part of that. I, I actually had a, a conversation with my partner about this yesterday because I was building something for the knowledge base here at, at Solutions Driven and it included links out to other content. Okay. And it was just things like I would say this document demonstrates something and I would use yes. the word this as a link, um, which my partner's a, a developer, by the way, so um, with a focus on accessibility and immediately was like, hmm, that's not very accessible. You know, if someone's using a screen reader, that's just going to be a page full of exactly. this links. It's not going to tell them what each link is. It'll just be five words, this. With you need to explain each. in this link, exactly. you will find and this click here type of exactly. thing. Exactly. And it's, it's something that just never crossed my mind because Interesting. I don't have anybody on my sales team here who would use a screen reader, but that's not to say I won't in six months, 12 months, you know, and it's, 
that's where education in these things is so important because if if you are a team that you know doesn't understand latino culture and there is a standout candidate that you're thinking of making an offer to you need to go well you know are they going to feel comfortable here and if we aren't sure ask them ask them you know like you know we are we don't have that diversity but how can we make you feel more yeah, comfortable educate us so scared almost of asking those questions yeah. because they think they will sound kind of almost offensive to a degree you know yeah. as i always say at least from and if anyone asks me about being bi if anyone asks me about being diabetic as long as there isn't malice behind the question it's I'm curiosity almost all, always open to talk about it that's not to say people should have to put their own like trauma up front to, no. to teach other people but you know ask, ask questions it's ask questions ask questions to know and i i always when i ask those questions i I preface it with, look, I do not know. So I'm asking you because I want to understand. I have, um, you know, I have members in my team who identified as non-binary. And I said, I'm very curious. You know, when you formally call somebody a miss or a missus, how should I call you? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is something I don't know. This person was like, they were very like, oh, that's a great question. Because nobody has asked me that. And I'm like, I just want to make sure that I don't make the mistake of putting a miss when it should be an a mix right and and mm-hmm. and and i want to ask people like when when people ask me it's interesting i i you you talk about this whole you know diversity and as an example of education sometimes we also have to offer the education you know as a way of hey i, I appreciate this welcome here but how about if i do like a session to teach you all a little bit about my culture my you know my my why you know the the how i live as a you know polyamorous person or how does this work like let me teach you about being a person with a disability like i think it's also important and i'm going to give you an example my daughter's school as we are in canada we're very diverse so they teach in schools many things right she has learned about every culture and every tradition in the world of different celebrations so it was hispanic heritage month and i asked my daughter I, I, is the school doing something, right? Because I see more and more, I'm very involved in the Hispanic community at work and I'm, you know, we're doing a lot of events and I'm like, oh, but I haven't heard anything from the school. She said, no, mommy. So I messaged the school and I said, it's Hispanic Heritage Month. I've heard a lot of other celebrations around the world and I think it's great. Have we thought about putting a focus on Hispanic culture? And they were very open and they said, we did not know but we appreciate the opportunity. Do you want to come teach us something? You know, it's how, that's how you get into, yeah. <laughs> into <laughs> having to prepare. Uh, and I had to, as I was sharing with you at the beginning of our call, I had to prepare a presentation for 300 students in the school where we shared what was Latin American Christmas celebrations. And I decided to use something that, because if I go and, and teach elementary school teachers about Hispanic and all that, they're, I'm going to lose them. So I was like, <laughs> I told my daughter, let's wait until December. Let's do this in December. And let's teach them about our favorite season, which is Christmas. So I gave them, you know, this is what we eat. This is what we listen to. This is what we do. And the kids were loving it. They were singing the songs at the end of the day. But mm-hmm. I loved how the school was open yeah. to that. Right? And that's, that's the kind of, and this, this has come up in so many of these conversations as we, we kind of um, begin to run out of time here, but I think this is a, an important point to end on because it's, it's come up in previous episodes where, you know, we've talked about somebody's reaction to something they don't understand often being that of a default fear or anger yes. or yes. almost retaliation because it's seen as, it's the idea of, you know, if someone tells you something you've said could be deemed homophobic, could be deemed racist, they're not saying you are homophobic, you are racist. They're saying that one thing you said could be deemed that way. And that school's response is is a brilliant kind of way of saying, you know, uh, oh, I I didn't realize, tell me why. Yeah, and tell me more, like, let's learn. Um, Exactly. And it's being open to that rather than being instantly defensive, which I think- Uh, And I think we come with a lot of biases because of, you know, I was, I was raised by two baby boomers, you know, a generational thing in a Latin American country with very biased ways of thinking. And, and now I'm learning a lot of things. Like, for example, I'm going to give you like a one huge example that I saw the other day. My, you, people might not believe this. My grandfather was black. So it means I have a mixed race on my dad's side. 
my dad is visibly mixed race and he has, you know, very curly hair and his skin is a very, you know, very, you know, light brown color, but that is my father. And I have a very European descent mother. So that's, you know, the mixture that comes into me. When I was a kid, I remember my dad hating his hair because it, you know, it was all these things and all the connotations that my family would say, oh, your dad has bad hair. And my grandmother would say, you have to keep it short because it's bad, bad hair. Like even in your own family, there was people bullying you because you had bad hair. And I remember my cousin who has curly hair, beautiful curly hair, and me who has very thin and, you know, not, not at all curly hair. They would say like, oh, thank God, you know, I, I got the European side. And I'm like, your own family days is telling you these things. And yeah. nowadays I think back and I'm like, why is that bad? Like, I love when I see everybody with their natural, you know, physical appearance shining out because we're all different. But I go back and I say, I was raised that way. So sometimes that bias speaks to you from mm -hmm. the back of your head. And, and you don't, and unconsciously you do this. So I think we also have to have a very conscious way of what are our biases that we grew up with is the only way to overcome them is to educate yourself, is to ask, is to be genuinely curious and, and tell the other people, you know what, I need to learn. Like I need to learn how to do this because I grew up thinking that this was another way. So I invite people as we're wrapping up the episode, I invite people to ask the questions. I invite people to not be fear, to not fear of a professional mother who is there sitting with you and has maybe three kids at home and who's, you know, doing a great job at work because they know that technical aspect or the sales aspect or that business aspect very well. We're, we're all here. We all can have lives and tastes and, and hobbies and we can all do a great job. So I invite the curiosity and the openness and, and I would invite to leave to kind of like question when that fear comes to your mind of, oh, you know, it's like, okay, what, what, what is this? Where is this coming from? Like, yes. it's okay to have it. I tell my daughter, it's okay to have the reaction. You're human. Just mm -hmm. ask yourself after the, the reaction, what happened? That's a really good point, actually, because sometimes that is a, a natural reaction to something that yes. immediately makes you uncomfortable. And yes. the act of feeling uncomfortable comes from those biases you talk about that might have been, you know, in your childhood, things you learned, things people said around you. They're not something that you necessarily believe in consciously control. It's 100%. how you then react to that feeling. If, you know, someone tells you something and you, you know, you've never met anyone who identifies as non-binary, to use your previous example, yes. not to immediately be feared and disregard their existence. Um, it's to, yeah, like you say, go, oh, why, why am I thinking that? It's because I don't know anything about the topic. I don't know Which anything. isn't a bad thing. What is a bad thing is not being open to then hear more. And sometimes I have so many questions. I'm like, I'm so curious. Like, how do you do this? And, and how does yeah. it feel? And how, how do you legally change your name? And how is that battle? Like, there's so many things that you can ask. And, and the help is going to come not because you can solve the problem for them, but because you're being a person, as they call an alley, of listening and, mm -hmm. and learning. Completely. I yes. think it's also important to end on the note that you you can ask questions, you can be curious, you can be genuinely well-meaning, but also not to expect those questions to always be returned with an answer. Because depending on the yeah. topic, it can be quite traumatic. You're asking people to bring up things that have been really hard for them. And that takes a lot of emotional labor as well. So I, I completely open, agree curious, with you. But at the same time, don't expect someone to unleash their whole life story. Oh, yeah. You. It's not their responsibility to teach you. It's your responsibility to be open to I agree. Completely right agree. Great way, great way to 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 end the episode, Dave. Thank you so much. I think we had a great conversation. I think we could so. for like two there more hours. Lot, yeah, we could have. There was we didn't get really <laughs> onto the the topic of mentorship, which I know is important to you. So perhaps that's a, a future conversation. We can Maybe have, I get invited again. Thing. Hopefully, we can we can have a return a return guest. But no, I thank you, thank to. you, John. It's been brilliant to talk to you, and I think um, yeah, lots of really interesting insights there. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. And, you know, I think this, you know, happy, happy 2023, everybody, because this is when this is going to air. So I hope it's a, yeah. it's a good year. It's come out of nowhere, hasn't it? <laughs>